Dr. Ventrella's lecture tonight is titled The Christian Foundation for Ordered Society and Public Justice. So without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Ventrella. Well, thank you so much. Of all the introductions I've had, that is certainly the uh, most recent. <laughs> but it is, uh, it is kind of interesting and odd how I came to be here and with you tonight. Um, I've known Chris for a long time and had the privilege of participating in one of these Bonson conferences a number of years ago and so forth. And he just well, contacted me and asked me if I'm you know, still a lawyer, and I said yes. And um, he asked me if I believed in the Constitution, and I said yes. He asked me if I believed in the First Amendment, and I said yes. And then he asked me if I believed in free speech. And I said, well, of course I believe in free speech. He said, good, I want you to give one in Torrance. So here we are. Well, having said enough frivolity now, I've got your attention. Let's uh, begin with a prayer, an Italian prayer, an Italian prayer for students from Tomas of Aquino. Come Holy Spirit, divine creator, true source of light and fountain of wisdom. Pour forth your brilliance upon our dense intellect. Dissipate the darkness which covers us, that of sin and of ignorance. Grant us penetrating minds to understand, a retentive memory, method and ease in learning, the lucidity to comprehend, and abundant grace in expressing ourselves. Guide the beginning of our work, direct its progress, and bring it to successful completion. This we ask through Jesus Christ, true God and true man, living and reigning with you and the Father forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So a couple of preliminary remarks. Number one, I'm very encouraged to see these people here, you all here. It's a Friday night. It's a beautiful night. I just flew in from Austin. There's a ton of cool things you could do. But instead, you're here. And that is greatly encouraging to me and I'm sure the other speakers. You would be here assembled to do some serious thinking and application to your life. And the second preliminary matter is simply this, to be honored to be uh, sharing uh, a lectern with people in honor of my friend and mentor, Dr. Greg Bonson. He formed me in so many different ways and we had a wonderful relationship. And to be able to contribute in this way, um, there's, a, there's a book coming out soon on the apologists of the 20th century. I'm actually contributing uh, to Dr. Bonson's entry in that, and it's just really an honor uh, to be able to do that. So I'm grateful for it. What we want to talk about is really under the big heading of applying Christian theology to this idea of jurisprudence, or what I'm calling tonight public order and public justice, how to think about these things with respect to that, with an emphasis on kind of the teachings that I've had from Dr. Bonson. So let's just see what it can feel like. I mentioned, you know, free speech. Uh, do people believe there's a right to free speech in this room? Well, I think I see some nodding heads. Okay. Did that um, right exist prior to the ratification of the First Amendment? Okay, so that right didn't come necessarily because of the amendment. All right. Well, can we continue on thinking about this and ask the question, um, is there a theological justification for protecting free speech? Well, let's put on our thinking hats, okay? Well, first of all, we have um, something called, in the beginning, before the fall, the cultural mandate articulated and given to Adam and Eve. This is not a product of natural theology. It's a spot of specific revelation, the idea of a cultural mandate. If you read the Genesis narrative, you'll find that not everything they needed to fulfill the cultural mandate existed in the Garden of Eden. They would have to go outside. They would have to expand and go and forth and so forth. What's implied by that? They would need to cooperate they would need to collaborate and to do those two things to fulfill the very command of God, they would need to communicate. 
And so that's just one idea of how we can think theologically about things we take for granted. And this is, again, before the fall. So first I want to talk about three foundational preconditions for developing this idea of a Christian jurisprudence for ordered liberty or ordered uh, society and public justice. And here's the first. A priest and a rabbi became friends, and they began doing things together. They would go to the opera. They would go to the symphony. They would go to the pub. And one time they found themselves at a boxing match. And the rabbi had never been to a boxing match. And so they're getting there waiting for the bouts to begin. And one competitor came in from Latin America, predominantly a Catholic in background, of course. He came in. He made his way through. And then he knelt down and made the sign of the cross. And the rabbi was captivated by this. He goes, what's that mean? What's that mean? And the priest said, what are you talking about? He goes, that man, that man, he came in and did this thing on his knees. What does that mean? What does that mean? And the priest said, oh, that. Well, it doesn't mean a darn thing unless he can fight. <laughs> Here's the point. Piety is never a substitute for technique. Father Robert Sirico uh, taught us that, uh, quoting Etienne Gilson, a philosopher of the last century. The point is, you can't do good unless you learn to do particular things well. And that's very important because a lot of people, particularly on kind of the reformational side of things like me, we like to think about a lot of things, we like to talk about a lot of things, yada, yada, yada. We can, you know, deadlift 400 pounds and yet we can't work 40 hours a week hard. And so we need to learn to be skilled. That's a precondition to the whole topic of ordered society and public justice. Second of all, we need to really grapple with our textual orientation. Oops, did you hear what I said? Textual orientation. So we're going to have a little audience participation here and uh, check you out a little bit. True or false? Delia sheared Samson's hair. True or false? Uh, yeah, no one knows. It's false. He did she asks someone else to do that. Okay, well then maybe you don't like true and false. Where in the Bible does it say ashes to ashes and dust to dust? It doesn't. That's from the Book of Common Prayer. Oh, okay. True or false? The Bible says pride goes before fall. We all know that is false. Pride goes before destruction, says the Proverbs. True or false? Noah's Ark landed on Mount Ararat. We all know that. You're right. <laughs> The mountains of Ararat. Okay, fine, smarty pants. Here we go. <laughs> Fill in the blank. Fill in the blank. The blank will dwell with the lamb. Now, we know what that is, right? Yeah, false. <laughs> it's the wolf. The wolf will do that. All right. True or false? Elijah was taken to heaven in a fiery chariot. And that, of course, is? Uh, you don't know. False. It's false. It's not. He was not. He was taken up in a whirlwind. All right, let's just do it didactically. Question. How many wise men came to visit Jesus while he lay in a manger? Ooh. Zero. It's zero. They came to visit him in a house, and we never know the number. True or false? The Bible says there is no God. True. Two different psalms do that. True or false? Jesus stumbled and fell while carrying the cross. We don't know. It's indeterminate. We know that Simon the Cyrene carried the cross. We infer that Jesus stumbled, but we don't know that. Okay, not bad. All right. Where is 666 found? Yeah, it's actually not. 666, both in 1 Kings and, of course, in Revelation. What's the implication of this sword drill kind of a thing? Or we used to call it growing up Baptist air conditioning. <laughs> right? Here's, here's the serious point. We at times are so certain about our picky yoon preferences. Psalms or hymns. Psalms with instruments. Psalms without instruments. Do we have PowerPoints? Do we have books? Do we have hymnals? What Bible translation? What schooling modalities? Well, I'm a classical. I'm a classical, classical, classical. I'm a, I'm a this. Uh, dating or courtship. Yes. And here's the problem. We have very strong convictions about those kinds of things, and oftentimes we don't really know, we don't have under our fingers the normative text of our faith. 
our textual orientation has a deficit, and I suggest that precludes us from having a clear thinking about ordered public society and public justice. If we're going to develop this, we need to have a modesty, we need to keep first things first, and we need to have the humility to work on these things. Avoiding the temptation to uh, convert our anthill preferences into mountains to die on precepts. And so we need to be competent as a precondition, we need to have a textual orientation, and we also need to have the right theological orientation to do this kind of work. By asking this question, how do the core confessions, the skeletons of our faith, the creeds, the foundational creeds, impact and imply answers for socio-political questions? So let's just back up and ask some little questions here once again. True or false? God the Father is more divine than Jesus. That's false. That's subordinationism. True or false? Jesus, as the only begotten Son, is the first creature created by God. That's false. That's Arianism. Um, true or false? The Holy Spirit is a force, not a personal being. Yeah, that's Jediism. False. True or false? The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, as in Nicaea, but He's less divine than God, the Father, and Jesus. False. That's Confusedism. Okay. Jesus is God in a sinless human body. True or false? That's false, the heresy of Apollinarianism. Jesus is not God in a body. Okay, we can talk about that later. Uh, Jesus is the eternal God who became the Son according to the plan of redemption. Sounds pretty good. It's false, yes. He was always the Son. God is three in one, just as an egg is a yolk, a white and a shell. Yeah, that'd be false. That'd be modalism, yeah. Jesus' divinity is of a like substance compared to God's divinity. We all know that is no conviction there, boy. It's false. He's the same essence there. Jesus managed himself to the creation as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, we know that, right? It is, begins with a T. Yeah, false. It's false. I can't spell. Okay. Jesus was and is both God and man, divine person and a human person. Yeah, it's false. It's Nestorianism. Nestorianism. Jesus, the one person, is the perfect incarnated blending and mixture of divine and human natures. Okay. Yeah, that's false. We're going to return to that. It's going to be very significant. Here's a bonus question. Paul's name was changed to Saul. We all know that is false. Paul's name was changed to Saul. That is false as well. Good. You've read. What's my point? There are and must be creedal implications for public society, law, and public justice. Why? Ethics and law correlate to theology and doctrine. It's not a question of, we'll just discern public order from natural theology or naturalism. No, they actually correlate with a theology. Dr. Bonson was very strong about this point. One man put it this way, whatever is the source of law in society is that society's God. Okay. The battle for power takes place over title to the authority to speak in the name of that silent authority. Another person explained it this way, more to our point. Every social order rests on a creed, a concept of life and law, and it represents, get this, a religion put into action. Culture is religion externalized, quoting uh, Henry Van Til. No relation to Dr. Van Til, Cornelius Van Til. A re people's religion comes to expression in its culture. So the point is that law always expresses lordship. You can't sever the theology and expect to have a right ethic, public ethic or ordered society. Theology will direct us getting to ethics. Or as my friend Jonathan Burnside from the UK says, law is a backstage pass to theology. Law gets you to understand what's really operating as the transcendent. And so we need to know not only the holy text, we need to know the tradition of our faith to understand the implications of that creed with respect to that common creedal matters for an ordered society and public justice. So now with that table set with those preconditions, I want to offer sort of a prolegomena. 
With this in mind, I want to touch upon foundational concepts of human flourishing, the Christian's calling, and the common good. I think by understanding that will help us shape the on-ramps to addressing this issue of, issue of an ordered society and public justice. And I want to begin this topic by telling a story, a Christian story. The story begins in 313, something called the Edict of Milan, issued by Emperor Constantine. It resulted in what we know as the Constantinian Settlement. There, this act permitted the practice of Christianity. It didn't make it the only faith, understand that. It simply permitted the lawful practice of Christianity. It was no longer criminal. Seventy years later, in 383, another emperor, a man named Theodosius, permitted immigration from the east into the Roman Empire. In many cases, he did that with Christian motivation, the idea of taking in those who had been oppressed and the refugee and so forth. A few years after that, 387 on April 18th, a cleric performed a common and routine sacrament of initiation, baptizing a man named Augustine in Milano, northern Italy. After all, that's what clergymen do, right? They perform sacraments. They do religious stuff. They're all about heavenly kinds of stuff. Hold that thought. Hold that error for a moment. In three years later, in 390, there was an uprising among the immigrants in Thessaloniki, which was part of Macedonia at the time. And during that uprising, an officer of the Roman garrison was killed, was murdered. Well, I just got back from Texas. You don't mess with Texas, they say. Well, I'll tell you what, being Italian, you don't mix with the Italians. So what happened? Man, Theodosius sent the emperor, uh, his army, to uh, Thessaloniki, and they indiscriminately slaughtered six thousand of these immigrants. Don't mess with Rome. He responded swiftly. He responded sharply. He responded decidedly. But that's not the Christian way. The cleric that had baptized Augustine, his name is Ambrose, Bishop Ambrose, had the moral clarity, the moral conviction, and the moral courage to intercede against that diabolical act. And he did act. He went to him and said, you may not, as a Christian, take one innocent life. How much more may you authorize the taking of thousands of innocent life? And he barred him from uh, the uh, communion table, from the Eucharist. He saw public justice stumble, and he interceded for public justice. You might want to read Isaiah 59. It's exactly what Ambrose was doing. The key point here is that Ambrose's action was not outside his vocation. That being a clergyman didn't limit him to do spiritually heavenly things, but rather it cohered, cohered with and expressed it. His theology correlated to the here and now, to how he lived life on earth. There was no dualism, that is to say a radical bifurcation between gospel and law, between sacred and secular, between natural and grace, nature and grace, between clergy and laity. And this uh, illustrates what I've been calling since about April the Ambrose option. You've heard of the Benedict option perhaps? I think the Ambrose option is the one that's more faithful. And this is a view and course of conduct that actually reflects Christian calling, protects human flourishing, and promotes the actual common good, all the while by avoiding Leviathan. It produces instead ordered society and public justice. The course of conduct requires then legal facets with respect to that. This is the Christian uh, tradition. It started very early, long before Ambrose. For example, Tertullian, a church father and a lawyer, by the way, uh, gave us the very term religious liberty. Uh, his basically uh, contemporary Lactantius did the same thing, promoting religious liberty. We see in the East, Gregory of Nyssa's homily condemning categorically slavery. That was, of course, due to predominant Hellenistic predicates. But there was a different worldview. The Christian worldview, taking Christ captive, got rid of these Hellenistic ideas of chattel slavery. Now, the church did not always be coherent, was consistent with it, but read that homily. It's categorical. It's beautiful. We see later then Justinian, with respect to the Justinian legal code, actually rejecting part of Augustine here, saying you may not have 
coercive uh, conversions of Jews and pagans. That's not the Christian way. What was it rooted in? The very nature of the human person being part of who God made. This key point illustrated by Ambrose in the Ambrose option is this. No ruler is above God's law, and arbitrary destroying humans made in his image manifests injustice, and therefore the state, and thus law, public justice, has particular roles and particular limits. This is a crucial recognition. Benjamin Weicker puts it this way. By recognizing a moral code that stood above all merely human laws, the Christian Roman civil law instilled the profoundly revolutionary truth that the sovereign's will is only law insofar as it conforms to God's revealed moral law and no farther. Now compare that to what we're seeing sadly on the right. The left has done this for for decades, but this coziness with Leviathan, this coziness with having the state reach into all these nooks and crannies of society, that is not a particular Christian way of viewing things. So this all has implications for ethics, for law, for public policy, as we'll see, and it also tells us that worldviews will matter. So we need to now camp out a bit on how the worldviews matter and how they interact with our topic. Oftentimes, clarity is served by stating or reminding ourselves um, of the obvious. And so, again, when we're considering human flourishing, the Christian's calling, and uh, the common good, I want to start with what we might call practical reason. Not a law, but I want to use not a theological example, but an example from engineering. Suppose that you are tasked uh, to design a new airplane. Well, aircraft design is certainly abstract and theoretical, but it's not only abstract and theoretical. A good engineer must consider the context of his or her efforts. Things like oxygen levels for the pilots at altitude, G-forces, ambient ten uh, temperatures on the metal, and so forth, lift, propulsion mechanisms, and of course, gravity, duh. In the same way, when we ponder human flourishing, the Christian's call, and the common good, there's also a context we must consider. If we don't consider it, it'd be like designing a plane without uh, considering gravity. Or put differently, and this is the burden here, an advocate, and we are all advocates, we are all ambassadors for Christ, we must advocate for Him, not some general theory. As advocates formed by the faith, we must be informed by the reality set forth by that faith. That is has to go together. And so we consider this, this reality, what is that reality, under three other headings, creation, cosmology, and Christian anthropology, or what we might call creational norms, creational norms. So creation, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. Note, reality begins not with stuff, not with ideas, but with a personal God who creates from nothing. He does so by command, by his voice, by, we could say, law, a command issued for, issued for an omnipotent creator. The universe, therefore, is completely God-rigged. Those are non-negotiable givens we must take into account if we're going to build a society that is coherent with that. Now, that act of creation constitutes not a bare act, nor a purposeless act, but an act structuring reality, something we'll talk about in a minute called cosmology. And it matters. Now, why does it matter? Why am I emphasizing this? Well, Christ is the object of our faith. He's the one we worship. But he is not only the mediator of redemption, he's also the mediator of creation. He is there in the beginning, dealing with all created reality which is donated, denoted as heaven and earth. So let's talk about this in reverse order. Redemption. The faith we have, Christianity, is a redemptive faith. And there's one mediator between God and man, and that's Christ Jesus. Jesus is the mediator of what we call the new covenant. The problem here is we have kind of a reductionistic view of what redemption is. The scope of redemption is actually comprehensive. It's more than individual conversion narratives. In fact, Christ is making all things new. Why? Because he loves the cosmos. He loves the world. 
all the created order. And so, as I said, he is, as Colossians is going to tell us, that he is there for all parts of reality. We're to take every thought captive uh, with respect to Christ, including public ordering and public justice. He is to have the preeminence in all things, as Dr. Bonson emphasized. And so from a redemptive aspect, we have to look at it very broadly, comprehensively. But then we back up and say, wait a minute, our faith is also a creational faith. And so while Christ has preeminence in all things, Paul goes ahead and says in Colossians, for by him all things were created. And then we have the couplet in heaven and on earth that signals total comprehensiveness, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him, get this, and for him. Okay, what are those implications then? Well, if that's the case, there's a couple implications here. One is anthropology, and the other is missional responsibility. So what's this? Audience, what is that? You sure? You can prove it? Okay, what if I do this? It's a cone. It's not a pen, it's a cone. Oh, that's kind of weird. Why is he doing that? Well, it opens up an important question. There's a distinction between what does X do and what is X for? What does X do? What can X do? And what is X for? And the question is, which has priority? Which has priority? Well, I would say that design dictates use or confines use. And therefore, the key question we need to ask is, what is mankind? Or what is mankind for? This is a worldview question, and we can't be neutral with respect to it. It's part of real reality. How do we affirm that, and then what does that mean? What are the implications with respect to an ordered society? To be biblical, we have to understand then these kinds of narratives. Our understanding of everything, including law and public policy, and our responsibilities flow from understanding our purpose. What are we for? And fundamental to this question is something we call the image of God, the Imago Dei. So we begin with creation, the real creation, what we know to be true, that God has revealed to us. Our understanding this must take into account what we call creational norms or real reality. So, as to human rights, there's a lot of rights talk, a lot of wrong talk about rights as well. There's many popular expressions in law and society today. We have charters of rights. We have bills of rights. We have covenants of rights. We have conventions of rights. And yet, despite of all these well-intended positive law, we still actually see an actual increase of the persecution of Christians, the censorship of speech, the crushing of dissent, imposed financial hardships on those exercising their faith, the destruction of the weakest, including the unborn, the malformation of holy matrimony, sexual expressionism and sexual anarchy promoted and advanced. We have a denial of parental authority. We have gender ideology being imposed that renders children both mutilated and sterile. So merely talking about rights doesn't answer the questions that we need to have answers to. The solution, rather, requires presuppositions or foundational points. I'll put it this way. Until we get the human right, we'll never get human rights right. Until we understand the nature and purpose of the human person. And this raises the notion of anthropology. By the way, man is not God. God is God. There's a fundamental, unalterable uh, division, what a metaphysical division, the distinction between the creator and the creature. Again, Dr. Bonson emphasized this over and over again. And so here we start from God's perspective to learn about man. What do we know about the creator and what do we know about the creation? Well, I mentioned Genesis 1. The narrative goes on, Moses writes and says the, and I'll probably botch the Hebrew here, it's been a while, but he says it was tohu vahotu, formless and void. He created the heavens and earth, and it was formless and void. And then, of course, we see then God filling and forming. Hmm, filling and forming, making distinctions, dividing the sea from the air, from the creatures, making different kinds of distinct creatures who multiply after their kind, so on and so forth. 
And when this was being disclosed through special revelation, it began as an oral tradition. And if you look at Genesis 1, you'll get kind of, I say this respectfully, God's boombox, right? Let there be, and it was so. Let there be, and it was so. It's a rhythm. And they read it out loud, and they heard it. Let there be, and it was so. Let there be, and it was so. I said, let there be, and it was so. Let there be, and it was so. Let there be, and it was so. God's in charge. He is sovereign. He says it. It happens. Let there be, and it was so. Until day Six, the music changes. And they would have starkly said, what is up with that? A very different rhythm that was being narrated to them. He says what in day six? Let us make man in our image. Full stop. Man, though a creature, is different from other aspects of creation. This is what we call the Imago Dei. It's quite important. Now, how do we define that? Oh, there's lots of debates and this and that. We have theologians in the audience can talk about it better than I. But some people talk about it in terms of the function, mankind's function. So mankind is, is rational. So we think, we reflect, uh, we ponder things. That's true. Or perhaps we think about it in functionality as to being a creative. God's a creator. So we too, we innovate, we develop. That's a very important point. I think probably Dave Bonson will talk about that when he addresses his topic after this. Or we talk about it as relationally related, right? God is a society in a sense. He's three persons, one God, three persons. So he's social. We too are social. God is connected, rooted in eternal love. Uh, guess what? We too are to be connected in this way. The first and second commandments are rooted in love. They're commands, but they're in love. Love God, love our neighbor. But how does the text tell us? What's the textual orientation of Imago Dei? Well... We don't have to guess. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens of the earth, over the livestock, over the earth, and over every creeping thing. He goes on. So God created man in his own image. In his image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. What you see here is the ruler deputizing those in his image to rule. The idea of developing the creation as under God by mankind. Notice there's no hint of the state here. I think that's quite important. Now we have the fall. The fall fractures things. But importantly, it does not obliterate the Imago Dei. And in fact, Genesis 5 begins, Adam made in the image of God. So he reiterates it. Don't make the mistake of saying somehow the image is cast off and broken in a thousand pieces of glass. No. The image remains. But that wasn't where it ends. We have what? We have Jesus who redeems us. Okay, so what does that mean? Here's an example how we can apply this. Matthew 19. The Pharisees came to him and tested him by asking a basically no-fault divorce question. Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Jesus answered, have you not read? He who created them... From the beginning, there's our language again, made them male and female and said, Therefore, a man shall leave and cleave his father, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. They're no longer two, but one. I think you know the passage there. Interestingly, this is exactly how Paul deals with the Athenians in Acts 17. God who created them, the God who made you, tun theon. Same language he uses in Romans. They know the God. Well, the God who made them. This creational norm stuff is all through the Scripture. We just kind of ignore it sometimes. So then they say to him, well, wait a minute. You know, Moses, we're going we're gonna to trick you up, Jesus. Moses said, uh, you know, we can give a certificate of divorce. He said to them, you know why? Because of the hardness of your hearts. Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. What's Jesus doing here? He's saying that his redemption, his coming, the coming of the king, inaugurated now and growing, as he'll tell, as he already told them in previous chapters of Matthew, is a kingdom that repristinates, if you will, the creational norms, and we can act in terms of them. And so as we talk about ordered society and public justice, we can't get away from the actual purposes for which mankind was made. So that leads us directly to this notion of anthropology. So what does it mean to be human? Well, a number of things. First, humanity is a creature. A foundational creator-creature distinction exists. 
metaphysically, what Dr. Jones is in the audience calls twoism. Okay, there's God and everything else. The implication there is mankind is dependent as to his existence. Paul says this in Acts 17 as well. That's part of his argument. In him we live and move and have our being. We're dependent. Moreover, mankind is not autonomous as to morality or behavior, as to ethics. You are to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Second aspect of Imago Dei is that mankind consists of an inherent integrated nature. There's two aspects to this. To be human is to have a corporeal and a non-corporeal uh, elements, let's say. Material and immaterial. That's a foundational worldview piece. Why? Well, that helps us to understand things. That's contrary to Gnosticism, to dualism. Gender ideology says, hey, the real me is just inside of me. Biology and the body are at best irrelevant and at worst are bigotry. Get rid of it. The inside is the real me. I have a body. I hear Christians talk about this. Yeah, my body. I have a body. Nonsense. You are an embodied creature. That's what you are. You're integrated. And, of course, this is not only contrary to Gnostic dualism. It's contrary to the opposite error, materialistic uh, uh, monism, like Marxism. The real me is only stuff. There's nothing really inside of me. So that's a problem. So again, Dr. Bonson, his apologetic, would reduce these things down. Okay, the second aspect, though, besides this integrated nature, is that we have a fixed and universal nature. Humans have a fixed and universal nature. This becomes a platform for moral reasoning. And in fact, different traditions, like the natural law tradition, presupposes this predicate. And the scriptural writers actually uh, acted in terms of this. It becomes important. It can be known and can be applied by Christians to Christians and to non-Christians by using the mind God has given us. See this in James 5. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Why is that relevant? Because he's going to argue that as Elijah prayed, we too can pray. He's predicated the on a universal human nature, okay? It's not changeable. Remember, Darwin said you could change nature. Marx said you could make a new man by changing nature. Freud said you could make a better person. All these other competitors of Christianity deny this foundational precept. But interestingly enough, this idea also applies to unbelievers. Acts 14. Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you. And he goes on and makes an argument based upon the God who made the heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. So he takes this predicate and then he goes right to the creational norm that uh, pertains to it and presses them with respect to it. He, what we will call pushing the antithesis, as Dr. Bonson would put it. Now, why is those two things important if we have a universal fixed nature? Well, it justifies equality under the law for all. Accordingly, the law must be applied to each imago Dei. There can be no favoritism. There can be no sin of partiality. So, for example, racism, what we call racism today, racial discrimination, is always wrong, whichever way it goes. Justice must be blind because of the imago Dei. Now, compare that to the um, cause of the month that's happening, which has been around for decades, critical theory, critical race theory, identity politics, affirmative action. The Supreme Court just dealt with that very recently. All of these require a sin of partiality, a favoritism either on the rich or on the poor or on someone's pigmentation or lack of pigmentation, all the rest. This is problematic. It denies a fixed and... Uh, universal human nature. This is why Gregory of Nyssa can condemn chattel slavery absolutely for all time in all ages. This is why William Wilberforce could act to end the slave trade and act to end slavery. Very important point. There's an integrated fixed nature of humankind. Third aspect is this. Mankind alone is Imago Dei. There's a number of implications here. And you can't get a Mago Day. I'm afraid, you know, I know a lot of the good natural lawyers out there. I edited a book by one, Jay Bujashevsky. But you can't infer or deduce 
imago day from those kinds of methodologies. I've never seen anyone do it. People a lot smarter than me have tried. I've never seen it. You can't do it. You ha imago day is a Christian concept, and it's the bottom anthropological concept, the foundation. So there's five implications to it per se. One, mankind is social. Okay, so contrary to libertarianism, there is no like manifest individual that's out there. No, mankind derives from a society called the Holy Trinity in order to participate in society. And so this implication means that the family is the key pre-political foundational mediating institution. We're seeing people today get rid of, on the right and the left, pre-political entities. We're saying the state creates these things. Does anyone know where Yogyakarta is? Indonesia. It's a city in Indonesia. I've not been there. I've been throughout that area. But it's important because in 2006, a bunch of academics, a bunch of propeller heads got together. I'm just teasing. I'm a propeller head too, I suppose. But they got together and, and just published something they called the Yogyakarta Principles. Just to say like, hey, this should be the law of the world. We're really smart, so this should be the law. Well, look at number 24. Everyone has the right to found a family. Now, that's very subtle language, but what's happening here is they're shifting from a metaphysical pre-political reality to something you get to choose. And they don't mean you get to choose your spouse. They mean you can create your own thing and call it a family. No, you really can't. Second implication, mankind is rational, contrary to post-modernity, critical theory, and neo-Marxism. Therefore, this tells us that mankind can know truth. That's important because freedom presupposes truth, as Os Guinness often says. You see, we are, because we're rational beings, we are designed to make distinctions. We are designed to reason. We're designed to communicate, to reflect, to evaluate. Now, a lot of people on the right don't like this one, but that means and implies civility. If we're going to communicate, we have to be civil. We have to listen. We have to have charity. We have to have gracious judgments. Not canceling those who disagree with us. Not like owning the libs, you know, or sometimes you get these like these 90 second blurbs that go, watch this, they smashed this. Like, well, okay, but not really. That's not a Christian way of. How's that the fruit of the Spirit, actually? Rebut them. Have strong arguments. Dr. Bonson taught us how to do this, but he also taught me this never allow quarrels to destroy good arguments. Amen. Quarrels, not good. Arguments, amen. And so we can't do that. Third, mankind is a moral creature. Contrary to the naked public square of people like John Rawls, who pretends with a fig leaf that the public square can actually be neutral. It cannot. There's no value-free zone. No neutrality exists. Every act, as Dr. Van Til said, every act and every thought either says God is or God is not. Think about that. Every act and every thought says at bottom either God is or God is not. Beyond this, there's no neutrality morally. There's no neutrality spiritually. Mankind is a worshiper. Think about it. It makes perfect sense. If God created mankind and God is a God, the God, then humans are inherently religious, contrary to the secularist. Mankind cannot not worship. Every move is not only a moral move. Every move is a religious move. The question, does it man manifest the spirit of truth, or the spirit of error, what we call idolatry in the scripture. And that's important. And of course, Paul, side note, ties that to ethics, okay? Ethics, theology in Romans 1, idolatry, false worship, leads to false behavior, unrighteous behavior, unrighteous practice. These things are correlates. Fifth, mankind is distinct from animals. Believe it or not, there are people that say they're not. So the environmentalisms and stuff. We have things called echosexuals. Have you read about this? These are people that go out in, you know, on natural in nature and do things to trees. I mean, poison ivy, I don't know, that's crazy. That, that's on the flip side though, they have, instead of echosexuals, they have what they call technosexuals. This is the, you know, sexuality with machines and, and so forth. Okay, disgusting. Fourth big point, mankind is metaphysically and immutably male and female. 
metaphysically and immutably male and female. There exists an intrinsic complementarity effectuated by design. Remember the comb that's really a pen, okay? That, of course, is contrary to radical egalitarianism and faux equality. Now, how is that relevant to our topic of ordered society and public justice? Well, let me see. How about this? How many in here, raise your hand if you have a respiratory system? I hope so. How many in here have a circulatory system? Okay, good, good. How many in here have a nervous system? Okay, good. How many in here have a digestive system? Okay. How many in here have a reproductive system? You're all liars, you don't. You have half of a reproductive system. A reproductive system requires a male and a female to be a complete system. Design dictates use. This is crucial to understand it. This is all predicated again on Imago Dei. He made them in his image of likeness. That's the complete uh, uh, monad, if you will, of humanity. Um, fifth, mankind is mission focused. So we need to talk about that missional responsibility. We call the cultural mandate. What is mankind's purpose and to what? And notice that there's a cultural mandate, which is, of course, not abrogated after the fall. Noah is republishing that. If you, I don't want to use that term because it's confusing by some people. But it happens again in the Bible, I'll put it that way. And then, of course, there's the Great Commission, right? We have these things to do. The point is we're here to do something more than... Um, Consume oxygen and occupy space. It's to exercise tuition and these dominion and these creational norms uh, are pertinent to therefore fulfilling our calling to unto human flourishing. The universal human nature. Critical theory denies a human nature. Maleness and femaleness. The LGBTQ says there's really no such thing. That gender is simply performative. It's made up. And so we have to understand there's a huge radical antithesis in these areas, and that's our calling. Okay. So what's the structure then in which we do these things? Let me tell you another story. A number of years ago, I was uh, conducting a debate at the Museum of Tolerance. That's in Beverly Hills. And I was debating a lawyer, Harvard lawyer, who had uh, uh, clerked for Justice Ginsburg. And the question was the redefinition of marriage. Does the Constitution permit or mandate same-sex marriage? And I, of course, took the negative. He took the positive. At the end of the story, there was a Q&A session. And someone asked my uh, debate partner there, Dave, I said, Dave, you've talked about rights all night long. My question to you is simply this. What's the source of rights? He quickly said, it's not morality. It's not religion. He hemmed and hawed and finally said, the source of rights is the state. To which me, being a highly effective advocate, stood up and said, David, be very careful what you've told these people at the Museum of Tolerance, which was created for remembering the Holocaust. Okay? I said, what you just told these people was that Nuremberg was wrong and Dachau was right because everything the Nazis did was legal, issued by the state. Oh, you can hear a in drop with respect to that. After that, they took the video off the website. Yeah. <laughs> Touche. But that's not the real issue. The real issue that, that illustrates is what is the transcendent standard operating in that culture and thus informing the law, the mores, the norms in that culture. Why? Law expresses lordship. Show me the law of a culture, and I'll show you what the lord of the culture is, what's informing its going on. These go together. And our faith informs us foundationally about real reality, and that real reality has implications for ordered society and public justice. And so there's a practical question. How then can we address public injustice in a principled way if this is the cosmological reality? Well, if you walk into a room and it's filled with water and water's churning all over, unless you're willing to repair the broken pipe and unless you're willing to um, turn off the tap, sweeping up the water is not going to do much good. It's kind of a lost cause. In the same way, we can't just think in pieces. We've got to think comprehensively about this idea of public justice. And it's interesting. We have uh, History tells us that Christians actually used to think in this way. We have to address systems 
not simply symptoms. Here's how Don Carson puts it. He says, look, it is possible to so focus on the rescue and regeneration of individuals that we fail to see the temporally good things we can do to improve and transform social structures. One does not abolish slavery by doing nothing more than helping individual slaves. Christian educational and academic structures may help countless thousands develop a countercultural way of looking at all reality under the Lordship of Christ. More importantly, doing good to the city, doing good to all people is part of our responsibility as God's redeemed people. You see, it has to be comprehensive. It has to be systemic. Did Christians do this? Well, yeah. <clears throat> Christianity pops on the scene, and it wasn't a blank slate. I'm sorry, John Locke, the tabla rasa is false. Rather, there were many ethical and systemic competitors to the Christian narrative. And so these meaningfully differed with what Christianity offered. Well, how did our Christian ancestors interpret this and go into this? They were a minority. How did they go into this to address real first century problems? Well, there there was an ethical order that was predominant. And that ethical order derived from a worldview. And that worldview not only permitted but justified infanticide, justified gladiatorial combat, and justified slavery, just to name three of them. So infanticide or exposure, understand that worldview, women were deemed inferior, they were deemed less than men, that impacted their civil status and their property rights, and the ones that happened to survive were oftentimes uh, not cared for when they were widowed and so forth. And even today we have reverberations of this. For example, in India, we have a large office in India where they still have honor killings of widows. They're burned at the stake, the suti uh, or sati, depending on what you're doing. Sadly, we're seeing the needle move in this direction. It's actually... Um, inspired by the whole incel crowd. They've, they've concocted a word called gynocracy. Anytime a woman has any uh, effectiveness in anything she does, we have to be really careful. The Christian uh, worldview uh, is against that. It's the joint image of God in male and female. There's no hierarchy with respect to that. When people call for gender hierarchy in our ordering of society, that's just not a Christian conception. What about gladiatorial combat? There, in gladiatorial combat, the worldview that was extant, particularly uh, Greek, was that dignity exists in conquering other tribes by the polis. It's, the dignity is not inherent to an individual. Rather, your identity was derived from the state, or in some cases, the pre-political reality, the tribe or the uh, ethnic clan, that sort of thing. Christianity says, fie on that. Your dignity comes from inherently being imago Dei. Slavery, of course, was justified in the uh, Greco-Roman world, uh, arguing, as Aristotle did, that some men are by nature to be slaves. By nature to be slaves. Again, contrasted with the Christian worldview. Now, contrast that with the... I, th I think it's accurate to say that the earliest non-inspired Christian writing is something called the Didache, D-I-D-A-C-H-E. Some people have put that at 70 A.D., I mean, really early. And there, the Didache, the teaching, uh, contrasted a way of life and a way of death for Christians. So it talked about two things, religious rituals and religious exercise. These were not a part. There was no, like, pious piety stuff, internal piety stuff. So religious rituals, it talked to clergies, clergymen and stuff, and it talked about liturgy, talked about ceremonies like the sacraments, you know, going to church kind of stuff. But it did not end there. This is important for human flourishing, doing, going, worshiping together and so forth, Christian calling. But it didn't end there because the Didache said there's a way of life and a way of death, and religious exercise must be focusing on the targets of the way of death. This was part and parcel of the Christian's focus from the earliest days of the faith. It wasn't extra. It wasn't optional. It wasn't an add-on. It wasn't a dualism. Say, well, I believe, but I don't really have to act. And here's the examples they gave. Clear back in the first century, the way of death included murder, adultery, sodomy, fornication, the procurement of abortion, and infanticide. 
But this was like, oh, you're a Christian? Well, then you're going to be helping get rid of these public evils. Simple. You see, the Christians faced terrible societal problems. They had no authority. They didn't control the state at all, nor was that their aim. Rather, their aim was to speak the truth and deal with these particular evils. How did they get that done? Well, you got any Trekkies in the audience there? They got it done literally by Kobayashi Maru. They changed the condition of the debate. This is actually true. They changed the conditions. Kobayashi Maru is a no-win situation. I don't believe in no-win situations, says James Tiberius Kirk. So he, depends on your perspective, cheated or adapted, innovated. Here's the thing. They understood that their faith called them to act, to religious exercise, and that acting was part of human flourishing. And so what they did, they leaned on and learned from the Christian creational norm, the Christian cosmology. And then doing this, it allowed the Christian to uh, expose evil, to oppose evil, and then ultimately to foreclose evil through the structures and mechanisms of society and of law. There was a political agenda. First they exposed it, then they opposed it, and then they foreclosed it. On what basis? Well, Kobayashi Maru, a new premise. Steve Smith, who teaches down in San Diego, puts it this way. It was the belief in a transcendent standard that in time would permit Christians to pronounce these practices unjust and immoral. That transcendent standard could be used to criticize and in time reform these particular practices. And so this tells us that the positive law has a particular uh, characteristic. Psalm 94 puts it this way. This is a vexing question, but it helps us understand how they understood things. Can wicked rulers be allied with you? Those who frame injustice by statute. Interesting. What's the assumptive language of the psalmist? Well, positive law embraces a moral dimension. It's not neutral. Positive law is going to be a conduit for either just <coughs> or unjust statutes. And Christians should be discerning. <coughs> we can't just go, oh, well, the legislature passed it. It's legal. Well, no. There's no neutrality. In fact, this whole business about laws have to be neutral, it has to be a neutral public square. Do you know when that first appeared, the idea of a neutrality of secularism? 1846, and it appeared in an English newspaper. Tom Holland tells us, the great claim in 1846 of an English newspaper editor was first termed secularism was that it was neutral. And then Holland, who's not a Christian, says, yet this was a conceit. Secularism was not a neutral concept. C.S. Lewis taught us that. He said, again, so did Dr. Bonson, there is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. And so we see then the early Christians certainly understood that Christianity provided a just transcendent standard. It also, also told us that we promoted actual political tolerance. It wasn't like we're going to wipe out everybody by law. That was not the, the, what was going to be happen. And then thirdly, of course, it gave us this idea that we have inherent dignity and we need to protect that dignity and Christian calling and life. We don't coerce conversions. Well, okay, so God is transcendent. He is that standard, but he's also with us. There's a law above the law. It's interesting, you know, during Holy Week, Jesus is in court. He's before Pontius Pilate. What does he say to Pontius Pilate, among other things? He says, you know, that's, that's my translation of the Greek, you know? He says, he says, uh, he says uh, you would have no authority over me unless that had been granted to you from above. He's talking about cosmology in the midst of preparing to redeem the world. Fascinating. And so he argues that there's a law above the law. So the next thing happens is we've got this idea of the fall. What does that do? Again, I told you it doesn't obliterate the Imago Dei, but it does change some things. It fractures things. And I think Tom Wright gives us a helpful corrective here. He says, it is one thing to insist on walking south when the compass is pointing north, but to fix the compass so that it tells you that the wrong way is the right way is far, far worse. 
And so if we're going to correctly address human flourishing, public society, ordered society, and public justice, we have to have a rightly calibrated compass. By what standard? Hello, by what standard? Well, the creeds of the of faith help us to understand these particular things. It's not by bare natural thinking. It's not by excluding God from the calculus. It's exactly the opposite. We need to be corrected. We need the right lenses, as Calvin says. And so we need to understand that Christianity provides not the enlightenment. Christianity provides the basis for justified, justifying and tools for protecting and promoting religious liberty for all, associational freedom for all, free speech for all. And we see this in historical predicates. I want to just touch upon, as I land the plane, on how one example this can work. We'll take uh, one of the ecumenical creeds, the Council of Chalcedon. Now, note something so obvious that we miss it. We oftentimes miss the obvious. In the Christian faith, the past matters to the present and the future. We have a communion of saints. By definition, this is contrary to many of the ascendant influences we see today impacting our discussions. For example, progressivism. Critical theory, critical race theory, Hegel, Marx, cultural Marxism, gender ideology. All these are systemic competitors with Christianity. And they promote something very different from Christianity. They promote what I call regeneration by repudiation. This is the hermeneutic of suspicion, Genesis 3.1. Did God really say? Did God really say? Questioning the accuracy of the compass. And so they want to bulldoze the past. But that's just not wisdom. Cicero put it this way. Not to know what happened before you were born is to remain a child forever. In fact, creeds are essential and they're a necessity. Albert Moeller, uh, the Baptist at Southern Seminary, put it this way. The church must also stand on confessional fidelity as a hallmark of its identity. The faith once delivered to the saints must be expressed and defined and defended in confessional form. Even legal scholars, really bright men, Cass Sunstein and Adrian Vermeule, I was just with them two weeks ago at Harvard Law, they both teach there, said that the Christian creeds, and they call out the Nicene Creed, has legal import. Oh, I wish the Christians were smart enough to be with these guys who understood that. Yeah, they do, because what we confess theologically has ethical and thus legal implications. These guys understand it. For Mule, Adrian is a Christian, uh, Cass Sunstein is not. Now, why is that the case? Because the creeds set forth a different worldview. And the different worldview, in fact, impacts a different culture, which communicates a different ethic, which produces a different law and policy. So we'll get to Chalcedon here, and I want to just talk about some of it. So Chalcedon is a formula. You can look it up. I'm going to pull parts out and show you the implications legally from it. It says that Christ is perfect in manhood, truly God, and truly man. So human nature is presumed and affirmed as being relevant and real. The creed goes on to say that Christ has a reasonable or rational soul and body. Soul and body. Mankind has a nature, in a nature, of an integrated person. We talked about that. Now, again, compare, for example, gender ideology. I'm a man trapped in a woman's body, right? That's a dualism that's not integrated. So post-modernity, uh, queer studies are fundamentally dualistic and fundamentally Gnostic. They believe that things that exist are either performative or simply socially constructed. That's not what the Christian faith says. The creed says that, uh, our, uh, that Christ's nature as a manhood is consubstantial with us. He is like all things unto us. So not only does Christ have a human nature, it's affirmed, it's real and relevant, but it's real. It's consubstantial with all of us. Again, the Imago Dei. So there exists a robust universal anthropology, and that's individually present inherently in every human, past, present, and future. And this anthropology does not vary as the time. Geography, ethnicity, coloration, clan, tribe, the predicate of identity politics. No, not at all. The implication there, of course, is 
why a law passed today can bind someone 100 years from now. If that person 100 years from now was not the same nature, a different kind of human, that would be unjust. It's not unjust because we have a universal nature. The creed also tells us that um, Christ has two natures, just telling us again that we have a nature, we can affirm a nature, because um, starting with Darwin, there is no nature, theoretically. Okay. The creed says that um, Christ is one person, calls out the fact that he's one person. That's important because that affirms and valorizes individual persons without needing to co-brand via clan, tribal affiliation, and so forth, which implicitly rejects identity politics and power differentials and all this sort of stuff. You know that individuals don't exist under critical theory? There are no universals, there's no human nature, nor are there individuals. Your value can only be assessed however many categories or boxes you check. That's the theory and how it works. That denies universals and denies individuals and thus justifies unequal treatment under the law, which is what you're seeing now. It's like, well, we can't treat you people that way because you are, you know, these boxes and this person's part of that box. Unequal treatment under the law is fascinating. The idea is oppressed versus oppressor. You know, in classical Marxism, it was the class warfare, wealthy versus the non-wealthy. The neo-Marxists said, forget that. We need to be funded. So they went to the category of oppressed and oppressor. You know, Bill Gates, Bezos, you're okay. Just because you're, you know, white males, it doesn't matter because, hey, you know, it's about oppressor and oppressor. So they can then utilize this. It's a smart move. Okay, well, I digress. Let me uh, land the plane by talking about the big picture of what Chalcedon did. Number one, Chalcedon defeated statism in principle and was really the foundation of Western civilization. That Western civilization was predicated upon a higher law, that is to say, the Lord. There's a law above the law. With progressivism, CRT, the state is the only transcendent, the most powerful thing around. The state is the highest authority because these worldviews deny meta, what are called meta narratives. They deny comprehensive worldviews. So the default of the transcendent is always the state. State power is the goal. That's not what we have. And that's not what, by the way, the United States was founded. I won't go into constitutional law, but it was founded on a very opposite thing. Second of all, the state, however, is not to be ignored or diminished or delegitimated. Some people react to the state and go, yeah, the First Amendment should say Congress shall make no law, period. Ha, 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 ha. Well, no, that's not the Christian position either. But the Christian worldview defines and delimits the state's authority. The Lord of a culture is the lawgiver of that culture. We are called to acknowledge the true lawgiver, the true Lord. And so the state's authority must be defined by and derived from the higher law, from the Lord. And thus is not plenary, autonomous, or totalistic. Only Christ's authority is plenary, all authority in heaven and on earth. Autonomous, he answers to no one and totalistic. He controls all things, including all thoughts. So we need to understand that. And there's implications on how we structure society and so forth. Just one political application. Only in Christ himself reside justice and mercy. In the created order, justice is the purview of the state, but not mercy. You can't combine these things and have a good sense of human flourishing. You need to have pre-political institutions, pre-political associations, voluntarism, charity. I went to a conference, converse, uh, conference recently about a month ago. And they were talking about how we're going to take this back and do this, that, and the other thing. I did not hear the word pre-political at all. I did not hear the word civil society at all. I did not hear the word charity at all. I don't know about you, but I don't want a society that's all coerced by the state. I want to have free associations. I want charity to be biblical charity, not handouts and so on and so forth. And I think a faithful politics will parcel those things out. Okay. Third, in the created order, the state does play a legitimate role to protect what we might call natural rights. Historically, they were understood to be life, liberty, property, religious liberty, happiness. That is to say, you have to make choices about how you use your stuff reputation, and marriage, not the equality of outcomes, what's called equity today. Now compare where we've been the last several years. COVID-19 overreach, entitlements called welfare spending, 
healthcare, universal income, cancel culture, speech zones, speech codes, so-called hate speech regulations. Those things are Leviathan writ large, and they imply and require the sin of partiality to enforce. This is very problematic, and we need to be aware of this as well. And all this kind of stuff leads to a watershed issue. Who saves mankind? Who saves mankind, the state or the son? Is the state a savior, or is it a servant? How then is the state to be conceived? It's resolving this question, which is foundationally a theological question, a biblical question, which will produce the best political and societal outcomes, a faithful politics. You know, during the time of Nicaea, the fourth century, the question was, who is Christ? What's the nature of the Son? During the Reformation time, the question was, how is redemption applied? What's the nature of, of salvation and justification? Today, we're dealing with a, a different question. What is mankind? That's where we have to put uh, our chips to really deal with that because from that flows also the question of what's the nature of the state. What does it mean to be male and female? What is the nature of marriage? What is the nature of humanity? What is the nature of the state? You see, law and society was designed to apply and facilitate real people facing real situations. To optimally address these situations, we must understand first and get human rights right. We can only do that by getting humanity right. That will advance and that will protect human rights. To ignore, to dismiss, or to modify these creational norms apprehended through special revelation will be to undermine or jettison a Christian's view of the world, of law, of the legal enterprise. And thus, by embracing wrong ideas, ideas have consequences and bad ideas have victims. Let's not create more victims by being sloppy in what we do and being uninformed in how we think. You are advocates, and you must understand and derive your thinking and defer to the creation, to cosmology and Christian anthropology as redeemed and designed by Christ, thereby affirming and promoting a Christian's calling, human flourishing, and the common good. I thank you for your most kind attention. God bless you. There's this idea of a Christian nation. Is that a coherent idea? Is that something Christians should be looking for or trying to develop or trying to make happen? Is it oversold? Is it merely uh, a term of insult? Yeah, I mean, um, there's a lot of well intentions with respect to that appellation, but it's, it's fraught with difficulty, particularly in our culture. Um, as I tell all my students, um, stupid for Jesus is still stupid. And so we've got to be very careful, and that's not to shy away from concepts, but if we use terminology that are immediately viewed as toxic or radioactive, it's going to get us in trouble and just set us back and those sorts of things. So the question becomes, what do we mean by a Christian nation? We're talking about a Christian that covenants to God? I think there's only one there, and that was Israel. If we're talking about, and that's why I would say, along with my friend Mark David Hall, that America had a Christian founding, but it was never a Christian nation. Now, there's been experiments with that, right? The Solemn League and Covenant for a while there in Scotland, if you know your Presbyterian history. But I'm, I'm, I'm troubled by that because I don't think there needs, I think there was a legitimate separation institutionally between uh, the cult and the state in the Old Testament. And I think that carries over. There's a continuity there. And so the, the church... Uh, as an institution is not to be part of the state. Now, it is to influence the state, to preach with the state, to set forth the standards. I said, by what standard? Which, of course, was Dr. Bonson's, one of his books, um, by this standard as well as another one. So the answer is, um, let's be very careful with that kind of lingo. It's utterly misconstruable, oftentimes is misconstrued, and it's not really helpful for advancing the ball. I would rather talk about what's the content of a Christian influenced state and we'll start the locus classicus in Romans 13 and work our way that way so it only deals with justice it's a minister of God though this must be informed by God's standards and it only deals with um, 
actions. Evil doers is what the text says. So if I covet, that's a really bad thing. The state can't punish me. The state can't deal with that, ought not to deal with it. And when people start playing with that, they say, well, you've got to be really Christian. It's like, eh, I don't think so. Um, you know, it's kind of like, Let's be like Jesus. Well, to know how, if we want to be like Jesus, we want to know what Jesus is like, and Jesus would be like fully comporting with all of God's revelation. So that's just part of it. Uh, so my question is, I, I grew up, you know, 2000s, there's this big debate of uh, egalitarianism and complementarianism, and now in the Reformed communities, maybe a little more, uh, they're kind of both branded and 